Hey, so we are back talking about the ancient Near East. You can see it right here. Um, we've filled in a lot of the more important geographical features right here in our last video. And we are focusing on this area here, the Fertile Crescent. Now before we get into the actual people that settled here and the cool things they figured out how to do and the civilizations they built, I want to spend just a little bit more time talking about these rivers. And I know you're like, really rivers again? But these are cool rivers. They do really cool things. And we're going to talk about that. So you remember that this is the Fertile Crescent. This is an area where the soil is very fertile. There's ample water. It's good for farming and growing crops as opposed to these deserts and mountains that it's surrounded by, right? So we're going to talk a little bit about what makes this fertile crescent so fertile. I'm going to get rid of this green thing. You don't need the green to tell you it's fertile. Um, so for one thing, obviously, there are rivers. You need water to grow crops, so that helps. Um, but what is it about these rivers that make them particularly fertile? Well, let's start off taking a good hard look at the Nile. Yes, you have a river, but that does not mean that the areas around the river necessarily are going to be any good for growing crops. You've got deserts all around it because this is an area where it pretty much doesn't rain. So how can an area where it doesn't rain be so fertile? Well, the answer to your question is floods. Every year, the Nile floods. Now you may be accustomed to thinking of floods as some catastrophic, terrible thing that wipes out civilizations, but these are good floods. Um, so how do these floods happen? Every year in the summer, it rains up here in the Ethiopian highlands, right? It doesn't rain up here, but these mountains attract rain every, every summer. You get a torrential downpour, you get a rainy season up here. There is so much water that falls that there's not room for it in the Blue Nile. And it all just comes gushing downstream, down the Nile and out into the Mediterranean. When this happens, there's so much water that the Nile overflows its banks. Water goes spilling out on either side and bathes the farmland on either side of the Nile with water, enough water that it can seep in and actually support crops. There's, there's enough water in the soil that now you can grow things. What's more, up here you've got a lot of what's called silt, and I mentioned silt in the last video, but silt is very fine, very nutrient-rich soil. And I'll show you a picture of what I'm talking about. So you've probably seen rivers like this before that look a little bit muddy. Um, and that's just because there's lots of very fine dirt that's being washed down the river um, in the water. This dirt is packed full of nutrients. It's really, really, really good to grow crops in. And so when, when the Nile overflows its banks, the silt that's also being washed down from the mountains comes with it. And so as the water seeps into the farmlands, they're also covered with this layer of nice, fertile, nutrient-rich silt. So the farmlands on either side of the Nile basically get watered and fertilized at the same time every year. This is great for the Egyptians because, like I said, this always happens at the same time every year so they know it's coming and they can plan for it. What's more, although some years you'll get more rain and some years you'll get less, Generally speaking, there's not a whole lot of variation. They know what the range of normal is going to be. So they have a decent idea of how much rain they're going to get. They know when it's going to come. They can build their farms and houses accordingly. Uh, they can maybe get out of the way when they know that the flood is coming. So they can prepare. And they don't get washed away. Their civilization survives and their farmland is watered and fertilized. So the flooding of the Nile is just a really good thing that the people who live along its banks look forward to and depend on every year. So that's the Nile. Now let's take a look at the Tigris and Euphrates. Up here in the Tigris, around the Tigris and Euphrates in Mesopotamia, you've got basically the same kind of thing going on, right? You've got desert, you've got these mountains, does not rain a whole lot here, but you have this river system 
that makes it possible for people to grow crops. And again, you're going to have flooding happen to make, make it so that all of this land around the river is watered and fertilized on a pretty regular basis. It works a little bit differently for the Mesopotamians, though, and I'll show you why. So I mentioned that it doesn't rain a whole lot here, but what you do have up here in, this mount in these mountains is snow. You've got snow on the mountains, and every spring, the snow melts. When the snow melts, it goes into the rivers, there's too much water for the rivers to handle, and a flood happens, and it goes gushing into the, into the Persian Gulf, right? Sploosh, rushing down the Tigris and Euphrates, going downhill into the Persian Gulf, overflowing its banks on the way, and bathing the farmland on either side of the Tigris and Euphrates with wonderful life-giving water, nutrient-rich silt that comes rushing down with the water. So just like with the Nile, the farmland here is getting watered and fertilized every year when these snows melt. Particularly this area between the rivers because it kind of, it gets, it gets it from both sides, right? You get water and silt from both rivers. The main difference is that whereas the flooding on the Nile was pretty predictable, up here in Mesopotamia, the flooding of the Tigris and Euphrates is very unpredictable. You know it's going to happen every year, but the people who live here are never really able to predict how much water they're going to get. So some years you've got a nice flood. It's not catastrophically destructive. It's an amount of water that people can kind of handle, and it's enough to saturate the land around the rivers so that they can grow crops. Some years you might get just a very disappointing trickle coming down and a lot of the farmland doesn't get watered. This happens a few years in a row and you've got a pretty serious drought on your hands. Maybe now you're not able to grow enough food to feed everyone in your house or in your city or to sustain a civilization. Other years you get too much water. You have so much water from unexpectedly large amounts of snowmelt rushing down that it just washes your entire farm away. Um, in some cases, we think that parts of cities might have been washed away in particularly violent, destructive, catastrophic floods. So whereas the folks here in Egypt have a very positive relationship with their river and their, their yearly floods, up here in Mesopotamia, it's a very different story. Um, they need the floods. They depend on the flooding of these rivers for their agriculture to be able to eat and sustain civilizations. But they always know that they might not get enough water or they might get so much that they're just wiped out.